The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Zero Squared is the Zero Books podcast. Hello, Zero Books listeners and readers. This week's podcast features a conversation with Ashley Frawley, who is the author of the book The Semiotics of Happiness and a reader at Zero. We're talking about the fragility that psychological fixes for social problems and genders in the population. So, by the way, this is Douglas Lane. I'm the host of the podcast and the publisher of Zero Books. And if you're a fan of the podcast, you should consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, we are now releasing interviews through YouTube live stream that are just for our Patreon supporters. And uh, we're also releasing uh, ebook each month for Zero Books Club members, people who donate $15 a month. And there's a new series of videos called uh, The History of Communism which I'm a little bit behind on, but which is going to be coming out on a regular schedule again soon. I'm going to hopefully start releasing the videos that we release as podcasts as well. I made you just do that through the Patreon. Um, so if you like what you hear, come over to Patreon. There's a lot more there. And uh, at the moment, the music you're listening to is Macintosh Plus. But uh, it's the uh, 420 by Macintosh Plus. But in just a moment, you'll be listening to Ashley Frawley and I discuss the fragility of the left. I'm recording my side, and now I'm recording your side. So say, say something. Yep, perfect. I see a wave pattern, so that means it's working. Um yeah, so listen, uh, uh, what I want to do to, to start here now that we're recording um, is get you to introduce yourself again because I'm just lazy, and then also um, to introduce uh, the lecture that we're going to talk about, uh, where you gave it and what it was and all that kind of thing. Could, is that a good place to start? Yeah, just where where you – because I've got the lecture and your notes for the lecture, but I've forgotten the venue. So So, yeah. Uh, my name is Ashley Frawley. I'm senior lecturer in sociology and social policy at Swansea University. And um, I've written, well, published one book, <laughs> Semiotics of Happiness, Rhetorical Beginnings of a Public Problem. And I'm currently desperately trying to finish the second book, which is called Significant Emotions. And I've pushed back, I pushed it back many, many times because I've had two, two children, which I do not recommend after signing a book contract. <laughs> Uh, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. And then hopefully after that, I'll write a book for Zero. Yeah, I, I definitely want to get you on our roster of authors. Uh, the subject we're going to be talking about today is, is, I think, a really important one, one that I, I kind of want to put at the center of the whole imprint uh, about returning to reason as our primary mode uh, uh, on the left and uh, a return also, an embrace of faith in people as rational subjects and just what that might mean. And you gave a lecture recently. Where where did you present that? So I gave a lecture uh, a couple of weeks ago um, just outside of London. Um, and the lecture was called Emotion and Reason. And it was at an event called the Academy, which is a, a three day, two and a half day uh, sort of um, summer school, I suppose, with lots of different lectures from various people um, and the, on a particular theme. And the theme was the culture wars. And I've been going to the academy for a long time. And I was really, uh, really amazed that they uh, asked me to speak. I, um, I was really daunted by the prospect of 
you know, um, talking in front of people that I respect a huge amount. So it was, uh, it was an interesting experience and the lecture seemed to have gone down well. And I was talking about the, um, uh, the rise of emotion problems in the public sphere and, and what that says about how we, how we view, uh, the rational human subject. So the Academy, um, is that a kind of a think tank or, uh, is it attached to the battle of ideas or you said it was a summer school? Yeah, it's attached to the Battle of Ideas. It's not a think tank. It's like um, like anybody can go. It's like a just the 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 slogan was I don't know if it's still the slogan, but it's it was the university as it should be. So I just noticed and I can't help but comment that doing a, a seminar or a series of lectures on the topic of the culture war uh, is already kind of framing yourself in a particular way. I mean that you're either a contrarian on the left or or part of the right. I think if you even mention the culture war, I think that's a, it's really sad. Actually, um, I think there are reasons why we're we're stuck fighting a never-ending culture war, uh, and that's actually part of what I talked about. Um, that yeah, when we, I'm not saying yeah. you should be. I'm just saying that's sort of how I, I think that it's a uh, it's seen now because there's been this whole industry that has built up. Um, I call it the anti-social justice warrior industry, but it's also sort of uh, an industry that critiques liberal policy or liberal sentiments yeah it's a really scary time to venture out into the world of being a public intellectual um it, you know i'm like i'm the sole provider for you know two babies basically uh and i'm always really afraid that i'm gonna say something wrong and that like what an indictment of the left that like <laughs> that you you know they might they might cancel you and cast you out or something. But I, I think the vast majority of people are not like that. I think that they are, there is a hunger for ideas right now. And I think there's a hunger for ideas on the left as well. Uh, um, maybe that that side of politics has got a lot of weird kind of power uh, on social media, but I think the vast majority of people don't think like that. Yeah. Um, well, your lecture um, was about the culture war, but it was coming out of your understanding of um, the way policymakers and uh, people in sociology, people who make social claims, have framed social problems around emotion and psychology. Uh, you know, I've read the the your notes for the lecture. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it because I guess it's going to be released on YouTube. Uh, the actual presentation, uh, but I'm interested just at the outset, how you see it as relating to the issue of the culture war. Do you think the culture war is a war about emotions? In a way it is because um, part of what has allowed people to claim or to, to I don't know, um, to frame things as, as much more problematic than perhaps they would have been in the previous sort of eras of culture wars uh, is through this construction of emotional damage as on the same plane as physical damage that, you know, regardless of how I think about or understand something, it's going to be de facto problematic and painful. Uh, so I think that kind of taken for granted idea of diminished subjectivity, that is that we are quite weak and fragile as human beings, ultimately underlies a lot of the claims that people shouldn't be allowed to say things that uh, challenge a dominant narrative. I do think that's kind of a bad faith argument to a certain extent that um, when people say they don't feel safe, I think there's a certain amount of like disingenuousness to it. But at the same time, I actually think, and one thing that's important to understand is that I do think that people actually have become, many people have become much more fragile than would have been the case in the past. So people aren't simply making it up. Um, and that's you know, one of the questions that people often ask is like, well, what's so bad about this? What's so bad about thinking about emotional health? And the thing is, it's not that there's this way of being human that just always exists everywhere and for all time. And human beings will always react to their circumstances in this particular way and always have and they always will. You're not you're not sort of like I, these these people are not identifying. Actually, I've skipped over now to claims makers around emotion to people who claim that like happiness is a problem or that we should teach mindfulness in schools. It's not that they are drawing attention to a problem that has always existed. They actually are creating problems. So like the the whole thing with happiness that I've been studying for almost a decade now 
is that it, it sold itself as this idea of optimization, of celebrating happiness, of uh, celebrating that the positive side of, of the human experience. But actually, if you looked at the claims, they were they weren't saying, "Oh, happiness is this wonderful thing." They're saying it is this very difficult thing that only we quite we understand. Um, and although their own studies showed that people were just about as happy as they, as they had always been, as long as people had been doing these studies since the 1940s, they saw that as a problem for one thing. And uh, they said uh, they, they pointed to other things like, oh, you know, drug abuse and alcoholism. You know, they were very creative. With the, with everything became a problem of, of happiness. And they promised that by promoting happiness, they would solve a huge range of problems. And you see this narrative over and over and over again. And it didn't actually, it never will solve any problems, you know, promoting happiness because problems in society are not caused by lack of happiness. But what it does is it, it makes, it, it sends this message that ultimately the start and end point for everything is you and your own individual psychology. And it induces people into this sort of introspective worry that something's not right, that you're always supposed to be thinking about your psychology. Um, and it, it, it is actually what they, they claimed at the beginning that, oh, you just you just invest in, in promoting happiness is in 2003. Invest in teaching happiness in schools. We're going to uh, save so much money down the line because we're going to prevent mental illness. That has not happened. <laughs> if anything, the exact opposite has happened. Because what you, you, you tell people, the message that you give people is that you are quite fragile. Happiness is quite a difficult thing that requires your constant vigilance. You must always be thinking about your own psychology. And if you do that, you're going to find it a mess. Like you're going to find something wrong. Years ago, I um, read a book called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, which he's a psychologist. And he had this theory that all of human culture was constructed as a way to protect the human animal from their fear of death. And um, it's an interesting theory. Um, and, but what, what was most interesting about it was that his solution for the, what he saw as all the social problems that came out of the fear of death was a return to Christianity um, or a return to religion. And, but it was, it was um, one that he was really, it was a solution that he offered up sort of ambivalently. Um, uh, you know, he wasn't fully committed to that. He wasn't sure it was even possible. Today, there's this guy, Sheldon Solomon, who, uh, wants to try to overcome racism and uh, and xenophobia, which he feels comes out of uh, our fear of death, through interventions around death anxiety in order to, and which this will have then a, a, a positive social effect, even on the level of policy. Yeah, you hear this, this narrative again and again and again. Arguably, it goes back to mental hygiene. Um, is one of the first sort of like positive approaches. And the argument basically is, it's actually, it's, it's a reversal of this sort of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs that if you took marketing in high school, you probably learned about. Um, but this idea that, you know, once you have the, you know, you have your economic security, then, then you're free to sort of think about the higher things related to being human. But it actually flips that around and it says, in order to have any kind of security, you need to attend to emotions first. Now, that's not my argument. That's an argument that uh, Edgar Cabanez and Ava Luz make. But the argument that I that I make is, it, I agree with that, but it, it's this positing of magic bullets. And they say it over and over again. First, we must promote emotions. We must uh, 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 manage emotions, that is. We go into people's lives and get them to think and feel in the right ways. Then, something, something, something. Solutions. <laughs> Solutions. <laughs> and, I, and I haven't like conceptualized this in this brilliant sociological way. The way that it pops up into my head, and I blame my husband for this, is South Park. Have you ever seen South Park with the underpants gnomes? <laughs> it's exactly that, you know, like step one, steal underpants. Step two, something, something, something. <laughs> step three, profit. It's exactly that. And you see this, I, I, I'm circling it over and over and over again when I was doing my data analysis for this book. It's the same narrative. Step one, promote emotion. Step two, kind of blurry, not quite sure. Step three, <laughs> nirvana. And it's this endless kind of deferral 
of actually dealing with pro and they will say like okay we know that these are ultimately structural issues but we cannot deal with these structural issues until we have rehabilitated the subject until we have uh, made people better and well and psychologically good but of course the dealing with those problems is endlessly deferred so self-esteem was the same same narrative um so like uh Social movements were saying, well, how could we possibly deal with these problems of the patriarchy and so on if if women don't have the self-esteem to stand up for themselves? It's a very convincing kind of narrative. But, of course, what it wound up with is this excessive focus on the self and, and um, damage to the self. And the day when we will finally figure out and try to think about those problems become, is, is somewhere in the future and it never comes. Because with each iteration of these emotional problematizations from self-esteem to happiness to well-being to mental health now, um, the subject just becomes more and more problematized uh, and more and more in need of, of dire rehabilitation. Oh, don't think about that now. Don't think about these big issues. People are suffering, you know? Well, I'm sure slaves were suffering too, but they didn't need mental health. They needed liberation. Yeah, before the slaves can rebel, they have to go through a 12-step program and, you know, do a... Jesus Christ, thank God this stuff didn't exist then. Get the acupuncture... Um, okay, so I, I mean, I'm totally with you here, but I just I want to say kind of off to the side, maybe that some of the ideas around, let's say with Ernest Becker, just because that's not one that you talk about at all, but like some of the ideas in psychology, in the realm of psychology are of interest, right? And they might even be correct to some degree or another, but when they're put into the service of, uh, maintaining the social order like you know protecting in the case of uh sheldon solomon protecting a, a basic bourgeois liberal democratic sensibility then by by intervening in individual people's lives then whatever is of interest in the in their deeper theory sort of gets lost i think um I'm just saying that sort of to excuse my long-term love of Ernest Becker. Uh, but, no, but, I mean, I, that, I'm not writing off all of psychology, not at all. I'm talking about right. these claims when they make their way into the public sphere. Inevitably, they start to tell these really simplistic stories about the causes and solutions to social problems. And they become powerful because in the public sphere, like, if I'm going to say, like, look, guys, it's the falling rate of profit. Don't you see there's this ironic inability to realize sufficient profit from the wealth produced? It's a contradiction. And contradictions go back to Hegel there, <laughs> You know, what the hell? Like, nobody's going to be listening to that. I don't know what I'm on about. But I say, you know, it's bankers. Well, yeah, it, it's greed. You know, I feel that. So you talk to people at this common den denominator of psychology, and it works. And it tells these sort of just so stories that everything is the way thing they, it, yeah, all, everything is the way it is because of, of our, the, the way the human beings are. And people will draw on these like pseudoscientific, like evolutionary psychology tales. And like not all of psychology is like that. There's a lot of really good stuff. Like um, I'm a big fan of, um, oh my God, why is it? Uh, oh, Viktor Frankl, oh, name almost eluded me. Uh, Viktor Frankl, you know, Man's Search for Meaning. I think there's a lot to that. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because he talks about how there's this need for uh, a project beyond the self. Um, and I think that, you know, what's happening at the moment is that there isn't any anchor beyond the self where we can derive meaning or truth from. And so that anchor is just moving more and more inward. So if you ask people, you ask young people to like, what's the point of education? Or ask their parents, they'll say, well, to make them happy, to make students happy. And like, if you're... I thought it was job training, isn't it? If oh, they yeah. get a good career. No, but if you actually talk to the parents, they'll be like, oh, to, will it make them happy? And, I, and, I'll, and I'll say, no. <laughs> no, and if it, if it does, I'm not doing my job. Like, it should be hard. And, but it's worthwhile because you're doing something that matters. You're trying to understand the world in a, in a, in a way that's fundamentally different that wouldn't be available to you had you not done this. Um, I've always, I always told my kids that... The key to a good life is to find something that you really care about and yeah. that you want to develop. Yeah, yeah. And, and that uh, if, you, if you can do that, then that will get you through. So if you're going to be an artist, you might be starving. But if you have that, you know, as your project and you don't give up on it, then 
that should get you through. I mean, no one gets through, right? But I mean, mm-hmm. it will get you get you through to something me- more meaningful. Yeah, um, I mean, ironically, if you haven't got anything to suffer for, life becomes unbearable. Like if you're just sort of dragged into this, like you're dragged into education, you don't know why you're doing it, you're just, it's supposed to get you a job and it's just kind of the thing to do. Well then, or it's to make you happy. Well, any kind of upset is going to be devastating. Of course it's going to be devastating. I love I love how where we kind of sometimes end up accidentally. Like, yeah, what we want to do is, you know, tell people they need to be thinking about things that are abstract and that don't have anything to do with them and be prepared to suffer. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the thing but, is, you don't necessarily realize that you're suffering because you're so engrossed in something else. But, well, let's let's step back and talk about the way that the the. Um, the kind of the emotional therapeutic model for so, for solving social problems works itself out. Um, people, so you've noticed, for instance, that there'll be a social claim, say, around happiness. That maybe before that there was there were claims about self esteem, mm-hmm. and then and then it it slowly is transformed into an, a concern not about self esteem but about happiness. Yeah, and then now you're seeing it being transformed from happiness into mindfulness no i think uh, mindfulness uh, yeah i mean it piggybacked off of happiness and well-being um but i think it's minor it's much much smaller um but but yeah happiness turned into well-being and then well-being turned into mental health oh okay so well-being not mindfulness but well-being and then now mental health um so I mean, the thing about mental health is if you actually, like my wife is uh, just starting out in psychiatric nursing. She's working with people who are truly damaged, right? People who uh, have major delusions and won't eat um, and literally are starving themselves to death or people who uh, uh, aren't sure where they are or or who are violently reactive, uh, who won't keep their clothes on for any length of time, you know, just wild stuff for those people getting them to be mentally healthy has it's got to be a priority and and by the way mentally healthy doesn't even mean functional right it just means not immediately destructive i mean they won't kill themselves or they won't kill someone else or they they won't starve themselves to death or whatever um I mean, that's the level that we're at because these are, it's like an emergency psychiatric ward. Um, but for most people, a sense of being out, out of balance, I think, is the norm. It's like that's actually health. Well, if you're thinking about it all the time and you're told that the norm is to be happy, you're, you know, you're, you're go- the norm it will then become mental ill health. Right. It's like I feel like we've shoved all of society into the psychiatric ward in a way. When exactly. That's not we absolutely belong. have. And the thing is, it's really ironic because um, I was just reading um, Donna Freitas's uh, book on, on happiness and social media. She talks about how um, the vast majority of the young people that she um, studied absolutely rejected the imperative to present as happy all the time. But this it's interesting because it doesn't actually lead them. I shouldn't say this, I don't think, but I'm not finished yet. But um, it doesn't actually lead them to then say, ergo, it's normal to have a, a variety of different feelings or live in different ways or to not think about your feelings very much at all. Um, but actually, it's normal to be ill. That it's it, That happiness is impossible. Um, and it's bad that we are, that we are asked to be happy all the time, uh, because really we're ill. So it's it's actually be, it's it's not led to this repudiation of that narrative that in in favor of one that says like you know it's just okay to be weird, uh, <laughs> or or like you know just to feel bad sometimes or to actually feel very 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 bad because of the nature of the thing that's happened to you. It's become normal to be ill. So illness has become uh, has been normalized. It's it's so people will say like so. I was talking to like uh, an eighteen year old kid at the academy, who was saying, um, "Grief is an illness." He says it's normal, but it is an illness. 
And the older people that were talking to him were really flabbergasted by that. They were like, what are you talking about? Like, it's, it is the deepest thing you're going to feel as a human being. As human beings, we are social creatures. We develop these bonds with other people and then they die. That's the worst thing. <laughs> of course, you're going to grieve. That's the feeling that unites us as human beings. And so he says, yes, but it is illness. <laughs> if you want to say that, then you just have to rethink what an illness is, I suppose. You know, it was like, yeah, it's a, if it, it's a necessary illness with that, without it, you don't have meaning. Yeah, but what, what winds up happening is that, and the main point that I'm trying to make is that people think of these things as like promoting happiness, encouraging people to be mindful and so on as a, as a kind of optimization, but it's not. It's a pathologization of everyday life. Well, do they have a, a human subject in mind who wouldn't be pathological? Yeah, they actually have created like a handbook of positive human functioning. So they actually have like stipulated exactly what it means to quote unquote flourish. <laughs> and and would such a human being grieve? Um, I imagine so. Yeah, like I doubt that any. And and I think that's again when you look at like happiness narratives, like claims makers themselves will say it is not normal to be happy all the time. But by that, they're not saying necessarily, or uh, that it is normal to feel a variety of emotions. They're saying it is normal to be sick. Now, they don't come out and say that, obviously, but that's the implication. And that, that's the message that's been getting across, uh, that's been going across. And I think what's interesting is that um, I've been looking at the shift from one cycle. I hate to call them cycles. And I haven't really got the terminology down, but from one like emotion discourse to the other. So if you look at mental hygiene, it uh, reaches its height in the 1930s and then um, uh, starts to decline in the 1940s because probably because of its association to um, the eugenics movement. Um, but as it declines, it's replaced by mental health. But also if you look at like the parabola of the fad, if you look at like Google Ngram, not the fad, but, but of mental hygiene, um, where it declines, you can see self-esteem actually come up. And I think that's that's interesting because one narrative that essentially says, you know, most of the problems uh, that exist in society are down to, you know, uh, uh, you know, down to our defective um, mental capacities um, that gets replaced by a much more positive sounding, far less eugenic <laughs> uh, narrative that says the exact same thing. Most of the problems in society ultimately come down to our failure to believe in ourselves, to have a particular orientation. And there was it, like it's amazing how explicit the self-esteem movement was about the claim that it was going to solve every problem. They called it a social vaccine. And of course, that didn't happen. And I actually grew up during the self-esteem movement. If you can imagine, I gave like we used to do speech competitions. I'm not sure if you do that in the States. Um, uh, but I used to do these speeches and I was quite good at them. And I did a speech one year on self-esteem, uh, not because I actually thought or knew <laughs> thought that self-esteem was a really important thing and important to me. But I knew that when you talked about self-esteem, the adults all got very excited. <laughs> 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 and so I gave this speech and I still and like I listen to these Jack Canfield tapes over and over and over again I believe that self-esteem is the bottom line of every personal problem that anyone ever has <laughs> and the amazing thing is that and, and like I listen to these tapes all the time my dad made me listen to them all the time did it make me uniquely like proud of myself absolutely not absolutely not <laughs> I, people ask me like what makes you good at your job and I say crushing self-doubt <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. uh, you know, but what yeah. it did do was it gave this message that I should be thinking about my own psychology constantly. And it sort of primed me. So when I was in university, I would like put affirmations up on my wall, like, uh, you're worth it. <laughs> like, <laughs> or uh, don't save happiness up for the future. Be happy now. You know, and I was like, why can't I just be happy? You know, uh, and I was I absolutely felt this narrative of and how it made you think about your psychology 
technology all the time, but I thought that that was normal. And I thought it was the result of scientific discovery. So when I started to read like, uh, you know, Frank Ferretti's book, Therapy Culture, uh, Nicholas Rose's Governing the Soul, this sort of critical literature that talked about how these things had a history and what their purpose is and how they function to basically act as forms of social control. It's a simplified narrative. But I was incensed. I was pissed. I was like, (laughs) You sold me this as like the truth of human nature. I had no sense that this had a history. And what amazed me and really excited me was the fact that human beings had been different in the past, that human beings had responded to things differently in the past, um, that I didn't necessarily have to think of myself as quite damaged and so on, um, that I could construct a different narrative of my life um, that was forwarded to something beyond myself. And that for me was extraordinarily liberating it, it is historical, this uh, approach to um, solving social problems. Uh, but the way we talk about it, especially when you kind of f- focus on uh, the claims makers and the, and the way that the, it's sold, which it is, it absolutely is, um, I, I feel as though it almost seems as though we're, we're risking falling into a conspiracy model ourselves. Like what I'm really interested to understand is – why did this approach to solving social problems arise? What 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 brought it into being this way? And can we trace it back to a series of moments or a stir- historical epoch where a different approach, let's say uh, the Marxist approach or uh, the en- approach based on Kantian Enlightenment ideals was seen to be wanting? I mean, was it something as simple as like the invention of the atom bomb that turned people away from uh, a more scientific or rational, reason-based approach to solving social problems? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's all those things. (laughs) So the the thing is that um, I really, I hate to play up the industry side of things. I've become more, I've actually become more and more convinced of the industry side thing. It, It side is important. And there's uh, a weird and interesting connection to um, um, this need to sort of sop up excess labor that um, resulted from deindustrialization. Um, so you see it in um, Wales, for instance, where they were problem. Well, in the UK, generally, they have this they had this big idea it was like the problemization of loneliness. Of course, they didn't call it the problemization. They said loneliness is a very big problem. And if you and if you looked at the documents, the policy documents, they talked about how being like um, being companions and, and making people less lonely was going to be a job creator. Um, if, if you look at the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales, um, um, they also, again, say that well-being could be this new industry um, that will replace the deindustrialization that's caused a serious problems in Wales. So there's all this excess labor. And you see, again, in China, um, it, neoliberalism and, and sort of pushing people out of factories, you know, has seen this um, trend toward training people as like um, therapy, therapists, taxi drivers, um, therapists, housemaids, um, these like expendable kind of companions for the middle class. So these these kinds of therapeutic jobs are a way to redistribute the surplus that's created by a smaller and smaller sector of the working class. I wouldn't like it's not the hill I'm going to die on, but it's interesting that that's happening. That 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 seems to be the you know there's there these there's a whole class of people first of all that are just trying to make a, a point a purpose for themselves, and I kind of see this when um, like I. Um, uh, I supervise dissertations for my students, and a lot of them are like problem discovery. Like it's just this whole area that nobody really cares about right now, <laughs> but they're going to campaign to bring awareness of it, and they've got the solution, you know. Um, and it's like this this creating a purpose for yourself in the world um, comes through problem discovery. And people like Catherine Eccleston is another person who works in this sort of area. She talks about how there's this whole problem creation industry in relation to children where just more and more aspects is absolutely out of control. More and more aspects of childhood are just problematized and um, the solutions are through these this specialized expertise that's going to teach you how to be the perfect parent or, uh, or more likely that's going to advise governments on how to influence people to be better, to be better parents because uh all all problems in the world ultimately come down to parenting but that brings me back around to the fact that the bigger question is why is this 
this expertise so much in demand? Because, it, it, yeah, okay, there's a huge industry, this emotion problem industry. It's enormous. But the question is, why, did, why are people so receptive? Why are policymakers so receptive? Um, and if you look at the prehistory, so like before these issues come up in the public sphere, if you look at the prehistory of the problems, there's nobody like out in the streets being like lay people, like teach me how to be happy or like in the workplace, like, boy, it would be great if I ever had mindful meditation. Like nobody's sitting there, they, you know, they have completely different demands. You know, you don't go on picket lines asking your managers to manage your emotions. You want more money. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. What underlies this ultimately? And I think you mentioned a lot of things. So. It's obviously with something so big and so pervasive in the culture, it's very difficult to draw sort of monocausal explanations. And you mentioned like the atom bomb. Yeah, like what happened in the 20th century dealt a serious blow to our dreams that human beings could rationally direct the future. But where did those dreams come from? So if you look at... Um, it's a long, sort of complicated story, and it's, if you go back to the Enlightenment, that's sort of the birth of this idea of the rational, free-willing subject, uh, and, and that's really the sort of first time that there was this glimmer that human beings could exert control through their rationality over the forces of history. Now, obviously, it was hugely qualified, um, and, and I think what happened was this expression of the rational human subject with all of these capabilities and freedoms came up against the reality of an economic system that could not make that subject exist. And I don't, by that, I don't mean that people are irrational in their everyday lives. And that's actually why I really like Marx, because Marx doesn't start with irrationality. He doesn't start with mistakes. Uh, human mistakes or human psychology or greed or anything like that. He starts with the same assumptions of the liberal, free willing subject. And he explains how people act rationally in the world and that the culmination of all of those rational decisions is something that at the aggregate level is extraordinarily irrational. So in, um, in the Communist Manifesto, he famously writes uh, with Engels, um, it produces poverty amid great wealth, a situation that in all earlier epochs would have been an abstraction, crises of overproduction. But can you imagine in a, in a world where people are starving, you have a crisis of overproduction? Right. <laughs> like, it's insane. <laughs> but, right. But the, the, what he says is that it's, it's, so it's not that people are irrational. It's that uh, we do not exist in a direct relationship. So we don't have, we, we, we might set goals as, as a society, but the, our ability to reach those goals is mediated by the market. So we don't have that direct relationship. And so I think that this ideal, like what Enlightenment thinkers saw was this little glimmer of freedom. It's like this light on the horizon of a sunset, you know, or a sunrise, <laughs> you know, you can just see it. But it's a bad metaphor because it's not like a sunrise at all because it, it won't rise. It's just it's stuck there. It's like, it's like a light at the end of the tunnel. But it's, but a it's train. actually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but we can see these little glimmers of freedom, this this freedom that was not available to people under feudalism, for instance, like you were born a serf, you died a serf. Right. Under capitalism, you are freed from servitude as a peasant. So free, indeed, you are free to starve, says Oscar Wilde. Um, but, you know, you what you were born as doesn't dictate how you're going to die. But at the same time, we're not totally free, right? You, you're free to be an artist or a cook or whatever in the way that you wouldn't have been a thousand years ago. But you're only free to do that insofar as a capitalist will pay you for it. So until we reach that point, until we can figure out how to release this wealth and abundance that creates the basis for, for real freedom or we're freed from this compulsion until we get to that point, um, are, there will always be limits to uh, the ability for rationality to be expressed in the world. So there was this gap, this gap between that, that ideal free willing subject of, you know, of freedom and rationality and brotherhood and um, equality and so on. And then when people looked out into the world, they were like, what are you talking about? I don't see any of those things. I see inequality. I see war. I see um, irrationality. And so rather than trying to explain, as, as Marx did, why that comes to be, what obfuscates the, the expression of that human possibility, 
responsibility, we jettisoned that subject. We said that subject doesn't exist. Uh, it's a myth. And the fact that it is a myth ultimately underlies most social problems. And so when we say that subject doesn't uh, exist, then we're also uh, abdicating our responsibility for creating what really is a very new way of operating in the world. We're overlooking the freedoms that we actually have now, the kinds of people we've become. And also, uh, we're uh, not taking responsibility for the kind of contradictions that exist, uh, the contradictions where you can create massive amounts of wealth and still be uh, in debt or, you know, have people starve or be poor. My temptation is to start to ask, like, what is the psychological reason why we can't take responsibility? But um, that's probably the wrong move, right? It's a good question, actually. I think we we default to, so like, obviously, there's this contradiction within capitalism between progress the, the the compulsion toward progress to to create um, and to tear down old barriers and so on but at the same time there is an extraordinarily destructive force within capitalism so there are these um, forces that are pushing forward and forces that are pulling back uh, and we default I think culturally to those forces that are pulling back um, and so we, we have this desire to either sort of maintain the present at all costs. And you can see this in like mindfulness discourses are a really interesting example of this. This is like this injunction to like find this little bit of freedom in the moment of literally trying to make time stand still. They'll like tell people to eat a raisin mindfully. So you like think about this raisin as you're eating it. And, and, but it's like it's a really good metaphor for this this cultural desire to like hold on to the past or like in happiness discourses they'll they'll talk about like oh well the true meaning of happiness was in Aristotle in his idea of eudaimonia which is very interesting because that was an idea of of um, perfection that is that already exists it's very static it's already within each human being it's dictated well for Aristotle it's dictated by fate you don't actually have any control over it at all. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's already there, and you just have to find it. Um, so they'll, they'll want to go back to the past and this kind of romantic repudiation of the present and the future. But it's it's not like literally going back to the past. It's using the past as this um, this place where you can take these lost values as solutions to the problems of the present. But why do we default to that? Why do we default to that regressive side and celebrate the destruction of capitalism? And I think it's because of the experiences of the 20th century. Country. Like, look what happened when human beings, supposedly, look what happened when human beings tried to ca- take control. The 20th century was also riven with romantic projects. And, you know, the. I was just about to, I was just about to say it. romanticism goes all the way back. I mean, even Marx talks about it in the Grundrisse. He says um, he says capitalism will never rid itself of the romantic viewpoint. He calls it its legitimate antithesis, which will be with it up until its blessed end. <laughs> right. Um yeah, I was I was going to say. I mean, what we're we're diving into here, what we're getting into here, is it's complicated and and uh, I think kind of deep. And I I feel like I want to go slowly, but at the same time, I want to go ahead and make some bold claims. Like I want to say that you can see the same problem that sets up the happiness industry in the radical left as a turn away from Marx and Hegel and to Deleuze and Spinoza, um, this because uh, Spinoza particularly um, has this idea that you know the whole universe, including all of us within it, is God, and that the human beings are simply finite expressions of God's will, and our task is to align ourselves with the active force of God's uh, unfolding. So that when we are doing well, we'll have an affect or an emotional uh, resonance with uh, our own activity and we'll, we'll be moved forward uh, in what we're doing. And when we are being immoral or acting poorly, we'll have an affect that will constrain us and be negative. And this is you know, Spinoza's affect theory. And affect theory is very big uh, on the left, at least in certain circles. And it, but it, I think it ultimately relies on a sense of uh, 
religious order, a conception of the universe as this innately structured ontological foundation that human beings with our, you know, arrogance and hubris have, have uh, uh, gotten away from. Um, and uh, so, but, and the other thing is, I think the way that um, we in, let's say, America or the UK tend to, on the left, tend to elevate or, or, you know, put people from other cultures on a pedestal is another way of doing the same thing. It's like saying these people, they're not human subjects like we are. You know, they're already in in line with the with God. Their their uh, strange ways and their culture uh, are so far away from what we're doing, and that's because we we're, we're lost. And they're they if we could just stop oppressing them, the world would be better, <laughs> right? Because they're already there. But of course, that that robs them of their subjectivity. You know, in the process, that basically they we reduce uh you know others to to animals absolutely yeah yeah it's and well what's happened i think is that if you go back to this this uh go back to the enlightenment you have this idea of of liberal subjectivity and you have at the same time so you have like extreme forms of it uh that i would say marx took liberalism to its logical conclusions where he said this society if will not allow these things to be truly expressed. If you really believe in the liberal subject and the possibility of human freedom, you have to take that beyond the economic base that we currently have in order to really free that. Um, so he actually he actually takes it to its logical conclusions that you need to take you need to take society further. Um, this isn't it. You know, it, history hasn't even begun. Yet. So you have that sort of liberal project. Uh, and then you have the romantic reaction to it, which um, talks about like um, the celebration of nature and mysticism and um, the desire to go back, uh, the repudiation of the city in favor of the country, um, you know, magical, magical thinking, enchantment of the present, that kind of thing, um, emphasizes cultural difference over equality or universalism. Um, and what's happened is that that whole liberal project has collapsed and all that's left is this sort of leftish version and rightish version of romantic reaction. So you have this total like repudiation of universalism and the light, the, the left version of that is a celebration of cultural difference. And the right version of that is race realism. But both of those things, this is Keenan Malik's thesis in The Meaning of Race, uh, both of those things came out of a reaction to the Enlightenment project, well, the Enlightenment. Right. And, and, and the, yeah, so, so to return to Marx is a way to return to the Enlightenment project as well. It is, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's also... Um, a subversion of this constant, constant demand not to think too deeply about things that look, you know, you know, even like even neoliberals, the limits of human rationality was was the market, you know, and we all basically now agree with that, like by by removing the market out of our, you know, our ability to understand the market and offer a completely alternative conceptualization of economics. When we took that off the table, we damned ourselves to fighting a culture war because that's all that you have control over. Well, one thing that's happened to me lately is I've recognized that when it comes to the market of um, podcasting and video making and books, that there's it's not free of its own presuppositions and rationalities, and those change as well. I mean, uh, a really obvious example is YouTube's algorithm. I mean, that's not some sort of pure marketplace of ideas that we're talking about. What, what's happening there is, you know, the state will make a, a, a claim like Trump won the election because of Facebook trolls and, and fake news. And then uh, the, the company will try to police itself in order to avoid... Uh, regulation and the solution has been lately uh, to really 
cl- clamp down on independent producers of media and push CNN, MSNBC, the BBC, and so on instead. So the algorithm is actually not sharing independent producers' work as well as much as it was because it, it wants to stop fake news from from being shared. What's so, interesting about that, not to derail the conversation, but like if if um if the if Hillary Clinton would have won that election and you know this whole narrative would have been like you'd have documentaries about how smart they were using social media. <laughs> you know? Like if you have like people talking about political spin when when it's like fits within the narrative centers and we're all kind of used to it's like this wonderful real smart slick campaign that somebody ran you know like trudeau is like that in in canada so this really slick slimy dude who just says all the right things uh and everyone's like oh so smart real good and you actually see people demanding spin demanding it like how dare you not spin (laughs) but we all know we all know that politicians are lying we just want them to lie to us nicely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, what's interesting also is I think that YouTube would still be imposing these kinds of moves on its own algorithm um, for other reasons. Because it basically in order to try – because it's not been profitable for a long time. So to try to bring advertising revenue in, it would end up doing similar, very similar things. It's not really just only driven by the state's demands on it. Um, but the story as to why it's happening would be different, and it wouldn't have as much justification. It would we'd be able to um, – the left would be able to oppose it more effectively, I think, because we wouldn't see it as – a. it wouldn't be able to claim it's making these moves out of a sense of uh, wanting to protect the society or you know for some social good. But it would be doing it clearly simply based on its own institutional needs. Um, but but I guess the, the, to just walk walk back from that, uh, just to kind of be to see what I, to see if what I was trying to say to myself maybe uh, and to you was that the neoliberal project was never really about just letting some other mechanism do our thinking for us. We always were imposing on this market. You know, it's not an unreg. It can't be an unregulated market, really. Um, and certainly, the neo real neoliberalism has been about state intervention to prop up the market, to prop up private industry. Um, so uh, I just want to, you know, so we're not, we even with the neoliberal managers, they can't help but get their hands dirty <laughs> in the process and, and ultimately be responsible for a lot of what's going on, even though they're responsible for trying to maintain a system of contradiction that is uh, that is in a sense objective, that's not, just something they've created. Well, here's something really scary and that I don't, I haven't got my head around this. It's a really bad time to talk to me. Like uh, writing a book is a bit like throwing all my ideas into a blender. So I'm, I, so I'm like half understanding things and half writing about them. But there's a very interesting book um, by David Chandler called Re- uh, Resilience, which looks at the rise of resilience governance and resilience as an issue. Which is it's just interesting and very similar to what I'm looking at, and he talks about how they go on and on and on about complexity. Oh, this is complexity is really complex world and com- complexity of globalization and so on. And this is coupled with this what seems like a typical kind of neoliberal outsourcing of social problems to individuals. But what he says, if I understand him correctly, is that it's kind of what what governments are kind of saying is that like nothing is within our control. Not government. We don't know how to solve these problems. Uh, not the market. We have no idea. Uh, and even you, you deal with your emotions and you just try to be resilient, you know, to, you know, precar- precarious work and that kind of thing. But even that you can't really do because you're weak and vulnerable. <laughs> and, you know, it's and it's it's really scary because it's it's almost this admission. I mean, if I'm going to have people trying to screw around with the economy. I at least want them to know what they're doing or have some sense that they know what they're doing, even if they're wrong. Um, 
and 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 some belief in what they're doing. But actually, it seems to me that nobody has any clue, and they're kind of aware of it, and that's kind of scary. We are now talking about the use of you guys as a form of casual group address, gender neutral, because this um, video has recently been posted online um, by the Now This website, which I believe is like a progressive news organization, huh. um, featuring a woman instructing anybody who happens to be watching um, that you guys, while it may seem innocuous, uh, in fact, you guys should not be normalized because it has a cognitive impact on women and non-binary folks. The form of social life really conditions the way people think, including Marx, of course. That's the first leg, as it were. The second leg is that Hegel's solution of a ongoing historical dynamic, which is there in the phenomenology, uh, that this, what Hegel grabbed hold of, Marx says, is actually the movement of capital. And that in a way, older materialism couldn't grasp that. Hegel's idealism did without realizing that it actually was social. So I think what Marx is doing is he's taking someone like Hegel, like he took someone like Adam Smith, and embedding them in his social categories of commodity and capital. If you ever feel like really hopeless, um, in the Grundry set, the very famous fragment on machines, it's like, I, I recommend everybody to read that because it's like, it, it gives you this sense of light at the end of the tunnel that isn't a coming train. Um, but is that, um, that, you know, you can see this, he, he even talks about like, he alludes to AI as well, like artificial intelligence, it's amazing. Um, but he says, you know, at a certain point, we stop being the, the objects of these machines and we start being the watchmen and then history begins. We can make our history in the full light of reason because we're no longer alienated. We're no longer the slaves of the machines. The machines become our slaves. Uh, now, the question is, how do we get there? And <laughs> never. And the, the, the most frustrating thing about Marx is that he didn't really say how we get there. Is some small bits here and there that are not very satisfying. But I think, and I hope, and why I'm so annoyed with what so much of social movements have become is that we're not at all asking that question at all. 